We start with our heroes discovering that Ethan is still alive. In two days, Ethan will bring Klaus back from the dead. Our heroes could easily defeat Ethan now while he's still weak, but instead, they decide to do nothing. Our heroes are idiots. Argo Funk Book Review, Argo Funk Book Review. Damon is super angry that Elena said she loved Stefan at the end of the last book. She said that before, like, at least a dozen times. But this time, Damon is super upset. All he's done for her? She betrays him like this? I honestly want to know what Damon has done for her. He hasn't sacrificed anything for her. He never bothers to act differently around her or respect her wishes. He claims he gave up drinking human blood for Elena, but that's not true. He fed on Elena multiple times in the previous book. Continuity! Anyway, Damon is furious that the love triangle is leaning towards Stefan for a change. Damon goes back into evil vampire mode, preying on young women and taking savage pleasure in almost killing them. He refuses to help stop the rogue vampires, even though he could easily defeat them all. Sorry, the world's gonna end! Damon is too moody to help. The battle against the Vitale vampires takes place in the woods. The werewolves fight, Stefan and Meredith fight, Bonnie uses her witch powers that we never see her practice, and Elena... Uh... Elena stands around and does nothing. The only vampire who refuses to fight is Matt's crush, Chloe. She doesn't want to be a vampire, and she actively struggles against her desire to drink blood. We know she's telling the truth and not faking it, because one of Xander's werewolf powers is the ability to know when someone's lying. That's an extremely useful superpower! I want that power! And that says an awful lot about all those werewolf lawyers from three books ago. Stefan kills Ethan, but it's too late! Klaus comes back to life, and he's as insanely evil as ever. The first thing he does is rip off Ethan's head and drink the dripping blood. Yuck! Klaus grabs Elena by the jaw and swears he will kill her. Not now, though. Uh, sometime later. We've still got a lot of book to get through first. Klaus kisses Elena goodbye. And seriously, does everyone have to make out with Elena in this series? Matt spends the entire book helping Chloe adjust to her new life as a vampire. She tries to learn how to live off animal blood, not human blood. It's kind of sweet seeing Matt support her through her struggles, and they kiss after she thanks him for saving her life. Aww. Sadly, in the end, she decides she can't handle a half-life as a vampire and chooses to die in the sunlight. Poor Matt is heartbroken. Bonnie has a love triangle. Xander's ex-girlfriend Shay shows up to help lead the wolf pack. They have one scene together where they reminisce about hunting a deer, and Bonnie decides, Oh no! I can't possibly compete with Shay! So she breaks up with Xander, only to get back together with him at the end. This forced drama is so inconsequential to the book, I think it was just an excuse to get Shay on the cover. Elena gets a mentor named Andres Montez, who teaches her about her new life as a human guardian. It works just like a tutorial in a video game. Occasionally, an angel guardian shows up and gives her a new task to complete. Each task unlocks a special ability, and she can't continue with her life until the task is done. Andres' power is the ability to control nature. He can make trees and plants grow. Elena's power is the ability to see auras. Now she can track any vampire whenever she wants, and that is a much more useful superpower than planting flowers. Damon sees Elena making out with Stefan, which is the exact same thing that happened last book, only with the two brothers swapped. Damon is so furious, he runs away and attacks a jogger, accidentally killing her while drinking her blood. Alaric proves to be the most useful member of the group, he discovers Klaus's secret weakness is white ash trees planted during the full moon. They go to the nearest tree, just in time to see it get burned down by Carolyn and Tyler. They didn't do it willingly. Klaus uses mind control powers on them. Now I have to say, 
I am very glad the series went out of its way to give us resolution to these important characters. They're not important to the book, but I'm glad we find out what happened to them. As you might recall, in the previous universe, Tyler was a werewolf slash murderer slash rapist, while Carolyn was a half werewolf slash pregnant slash possessed slash insane. In this new reality, they're normal people trying to raise kids together. Good for them! Nobody mentions this, but the book takes place in October. If Carolyn's twins are already alive, that means in this universe, she got pregnant about halfway through senior year of high school. That is a pretty unexpected side effect of changing book one so Carolyn doesn't try to steal Stefan away from Elena. Everyone figures Klaus is invincible now that the tree is destroyed, and that's not true. Andres has the ability to make trees grow. He could easily make a replacement tree! Why does no one think of that? They fight Klaus, who's wearing his ugly raincoat again. He's got an army of over 20 vampires, including Meredith's twin brother, and Catherine! Yeah, the one who turned Stefan and Damon into vampires. Klaus brought her back from the dead somehow. Klaus grabs Elena, stabs her in the throat with a dagger, and guess what? It turns out Elena's special new guardian power is complete invulnerability to magical attacks. Boy, isn't it convenient that she developed that ability without even trying moments before she got stabbed with a magic dagger? An angel guardian shows up and makes Elena swear the unbreakable guardian oath, before mentioning that if she breaks the oath, she'll be reassigned to the Celestial Court. It sounds like failed guardians get stuck doing legal paperwork for eternity. Elena's first task is to kill the ancient evil vampire on campus. Oh no, it's not Klaus, it's Damon! She has to kill Damon! That's a neat plot twist, Angel Guardian, but you should really tell Elena everything at the beginning instead of keeping secrets from her. Klaus goes after all the characters one by one in hopes of learning Elena's weakness, which is non-magical weapons. I'm not sure why Klaus has so much trouble getting people to confess, considering he has psychic powers. The most interesting attempt is when Klaus sends Christian after Meredith. They have an interesting relationship because she's never met him before and he remembers growing up with her. They bond over their parents and life experiences, but he gives himself away as a villain when he tries to crush her with heavy weights. Elena begs Damon to turn back from his evil ways, but he refuses. He strikes up an uneasy friendship with Catherine, and she warns him just in time so Damon can save Elena from being killed in an elevator. Now that Damon's a good guy again, they have the final battle. Elena realizes she unlocks her guardian powers through fighting. She asks Damon to smack her around a bit, and she develops the power to move things with her mind. She uses this new power to kill all the vampires in a fire. Klaus is the main villain, so he gets a separate death scene. He kidnaps Elena, sucks her blood, and dies instantly. Guess what? Elena's blood is poisonous to original vampires! Again, it is super convenient how she keeps defeating Klaus without even trying. It's like, why did we even bother having him be the main villain in this book if Elena just has to sit back and do nothing to kill him? It's, it's a huge letdown. Terrible way to defeat the main villain of the series. Andre says, Elena must be the chosen one who's going to kill all the original vampires. Elena finds her mother's diary, which confirms this. Mom was secretly an angel guardian pretending to be human. Oh, and Mom gave birth to Catherine 400 years ago. So, Elena and Catherine are half-sisters. Whoa. Well, that doesn't fit with the original trilogy. The angel guardians decide to spare Damon's life with a twist. Damon and Elena now have a magic connection. If Damon kills another human being, Elena will die instantly and the magic connection passes on to her sister, Margaret. Sounds like a sequel series to me. Elena is happy that she has a connection with Damon, and Damon wanders off somewhere. We finish with Elena drinking water from the Fountain of Eternal Youth. That way, she and Stefan can be together forever. Or until Damon slips up and she dies instantly, I give it about a week. The end. Post-book follow-up. The ending was probably the best resolution we could have gotten for the series' big love triangle. 
Elena's with Stefan forever while still having a literal connection to Damon. This is a dumb thing to say, but I was annoyed that Elena drank a full goblet of eternal life water. She should have had one dropped and saved the rest. I enjoyed the first part of this book with its extended action sequences. I'll say one thing for the author of this trilogy. Whoever they are, they are excellent at following outlines. Without fail, something big happens every 100 pages. The author is also good at drama narrative. When a character is alone, thinking to themselves, that's really interesting. It's the interpersonal drama that could use some work, because it's mostly overdone love triangle stuff we've seen enough of in the previous books. Elena's mission to kill Damon overlooks the fact that Damon has already died before. Not to mention there's this newfound ritual to bring Klaus and Catherine back from the dead. Seems to me like they could use that on Damon and totally get out of the Oh no, you must kill Damon drama. We're not told why the angels want Damon dead. Yes, he killed someone. But dozens of people have died on campus this month. Why is there no attempt to avenge any of their deaths? Overall, it was an acceptable end to the trilogy with some nice action scenes, good drama with Matt and Chloe, and some decent twists. I did not like the Xander Bonnie drama, or Elena's guardian powers. I'm sorry, but it feels like a cop-out when she twice develops the power to survive Klaus's next attack without knowing it. I give Vampire Diaries number 10, Destiny Rising, a 6 out of 10.